Welcome back to the Own Your Awkward podcast. I'm your host, Andy Vargo, and every episode we get into what has made our guests vulnerable and how they've learned how to own their awkward in order to live their best life. Stay tuned so you can hear every awkward moment in today's show. Welcome back to the Own Your Awkward podcast. I'm your host, Andy Vargo, and today we have the amazing man and my good friend, Mike James. Mike, how you doing? I'm doing okay. I'm, I'm, I'm doing okay. It's been, been interesting with the COVID rules and everything else, but, you know, finding ways to, to get around them, the obstacles, and keep moving forward, so. Sure. Yeah, it's, uh, I, I think that's a lot of times it's like, okay, we're still alive, we're still breathing, and we're, we're taking a step, so that's okay, right? It's like, we yep. just got to do what we can. Yeah, I've got a good friend who his, his motto is always forward. So I love that, yeah. And I've, I've adopted that one over the last year. It's like, you know, my, no matter what I do, I'm just always moving forward, you know, just keep moving forward and keep bettering myself. Mm-hmm. So. I, I think I, I read that in one of your posts this week was yeah. ended with always forward. And it, it just, that really hits home when you just, those two words are so yeah. simple, but they say so much. They do, they do. So, and I mean, really, everyone's like, what does that really mean? And I'm like, really, it means whatever it does to you. Mm-hmm. So to me, always forward is continuing my, my fitness journey and moving forward and keep doing that and not giving up, you know, and to other people, it might be, you know, continuing school, it might be, you know, something else. It's really, it's just kind of a motto to kind of, you know, make it your own. So right. What, I love that. Always forward mean to you. So, yeah. Kind of, yeah. Well, it's right in line with, I like to always think, just take one step a day. And yep. it's, it's basically the same thing saying it in a different way, but yeah, it doesn't have to be this big revelation. It's just, just do a little bit and keep going forward. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Mike and I know each other from the comedy scene here in the Northwest, but uh, yeah, Mike goes so much deeper than that. So Mike, what do you have exciting you want to tell people about that you want to make sure the world knows about what you have going on now? For me, it's one of those things um, I do. I mean, Andy knows me and, and it gets weird because Andy knows me both as Mike and Brandon. Because when I do comedy and do comedy type things, you know, I go as Brandon Valentine. Um, so I have a couple shows, you know, comedy type shows as Brandon Valentine. I have a conspiracy realist show as Brandon Valentine. Um, I like to say realist rather than theorist because theorist has such horrible connotations behind it. So, um, but then, you know, as Mike James, which is my, my birth name, um, I, give, I, I do a show called BeastNet. Um, which is really kind of, it's a show. It started off as a show about obstacle course racing, which if you guys have never done that Spartan tough mudder, those kind of things where you go out there and you run in mud and muck and climb over things, lift heavy things, do stuff like that. And that's what the the podcast started off as. Um, But then it it kind of evolved into more of a all around fitness and mental health podcast. Um, because we found that OCR was such a, a niche and that people really needed to hear more stuff about, you know, mental health and about all around fitness, because it's, you know, mental health is a huge thing, especially right now with, with, you know, COVID and being socially distanced, we're social animals, even me, who I've always considered myself a complete introvert. And then all of a sudden you freaking take away social and you say, I can't be social. And I'm like, I don't like this. I need my people, right? You know, it's been, it's been weird. It's been one of those things. I think a lot of us have learned a lot about ourselves during this, this whole thing and a lot about our friends and family. So mm-hmm. and I think that's yeah. such an important topic to touch on with fitness and health. And, and obviously that's going to appeal to anybody who's trying to do a Spartan race or an obstacle course yeah. race, because you've got to be in shape and especially mentally. And I, I know, it used to be that we didn't talk about the mental health, but I feel like that's gotten so much more opened up and it's so important and still needs to talk, be talked about even more than it is because it's, it's hard to have those conversations, but they're critical. It is. And I've been, uh, I've done for, cause my, my job in, in real life, um, I'm a safety professional in construction. Um, mm-hmm. and I have given talks at, uh, the governor's conference last year, and uh, um, construction safety day a couple times and gone places to give talks on suicide awareness and construction because suicide is a huge problem um, in construction. Construction mm-hmm. industry actually has the highest number of suicides in an industry. Um, 
Wow. Mainly because if you really think about what we do, the type of mentality that people have in construction, a lot of construction people are ex-military, which adds another, you know, mm. compounds on top of that because ex-military, we all know, you know, 22 a day. And actually they keep saying that. And if you look at the numbers now, those numbers have gone up. It's not 22 oh, a day. Wow. It's actually more like 27 to 28 a day now. Um, and that's kind of the thing that, you know, you really think about. It's a huge problem. And especially right now with COVID, it's become even a bigger problem because now all of a sudden we're taking away all the the social that kind right. of helps people that have depression and isolating them. And isolation is the worst thing you can do for someone who's, who's suicidal. Um, and that's kind of made things worse. So, and I'm not going to get on the whole argument on whether social distancing and the, this whole right. thing is good or bad. I'm just going to say that, for, for people who have mental illnesses and depression, this is not good for them. Right. And, and that's the case with anything, regardless of whether or not you agree with the science or the benefits of one solution for one problem. Yeah. It doesn't take away the fact that that can cause a completely opposite issue on another problem. Yes. And so it's, it's a balancing act of, okay, if, if we don't, if, if we don't want people to get sick and we need a social distance, how do we make up for, or how do we somehow keep people social and interacting and engaging and, and no, you know, no matter what you do, there's no replacement for in-person interaction. It's, no. you know, the zoom there's calls not. are great and all that kind of stuff, but it's just not the same. It's not the same. And, and it's been tough. This has been a tough year. Cause like I said, I'm a social guy. I do a lot of, you know, ops course races. I usually do somewhere in upwards of 20 to 25 races a year. Wow. And last year I did three. Mm, gosh. So, um, so it's been, it's been interesting. It's been interesting. And what's funny too, is it took, uh, this is also the year where I decided to go on my insane fitness journey. You would think doing <laughs> obstacle course races forever that I was already on that, but, um, I didn't do everything I was supposed to. And I was bigger than I should have been. And I still did the races and just kind of that showed the mental side of it where you can endure and just mm-hmm. push your way through something. Um, but I got tired of just enduring and pushing my way through and was like, I'm going to crush these. I'm going to lose the weight. I'm going to do everything I should be doing. And then all of a sudden COVID hit and it's like, yeah, you can't do races now. And I'm like, shit. Yeah. Right. Well, and there's that, there's that realization, especially with something like COVID where you can have all the greatest plans in the world. And at some point there will be something out of your control that erases your timeline or takes it out of your control. And you have to then figure out, well, now what am I going to do? So. So, Mike, I ask everybody. And that's one of the things, are, like I said earlier, with my. Go ahead. Oh, I would say that's, that's what I kind of said with the always forward is that, you know, there's always going to be obstacles, you know, and that's one thing obstacle course racing can show me. When an obstacle gets thrown in front of you, do you sit down and give up? No, you, you find a way up over around, you find a way through it, you know, and that's kind of what COVID has been for me. It's my obstacle this last year and it became my way through. So, mm-hmm. for sure. So, Mike, I, I like to ask everybody, it's the one question the whole show is based on, how do you own your awkward? What was your awkward thing you've had to own in order to get to this amazing place in life? I, and I've been thinking a lot about that and, and what my awkward is. And I, I think a lot of it is, and I don't know really how to, in a way, I, it's kind of, it is my depression. It's the fact that I've gone through depression, that I fought depression. And, you know, I really talk about the suicide and mental health is that I fought depression and I fought it hard. Um, And I've owned that now that it's part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And rather than giving into it, I have to find ways to use that to help other people. And that's kind of what I've been trying to do to use my experiences to help other people. I mean, some people don't know. um, Six years ago, I committed myself into uh, the hospital because Mm -hmm. my depression was so bad that um, I was suicidal. Um, But luckily, I was still cognitive enough to realize I was and that I needed help. Um, And I stepped in and I asked for help. Um, I spent, it was only about a week or so in the hospital, but it was enough to kind of give me that, that, you know, reset. Yeah. Start looking at things differently um, and to change my lifestyle and who I, what I was doing to stop putting myself down that hole Mm -hmm. um, of depression. And it's one of those things that it's, I've really turned that, you know, and everyone's like, oh, look at you now. You're so happy, everything else. And you look so, it's like, you see what I want you to see on Facebook. Right. Well, you and see that I still battle depression every day. So, yeah, I, I've, I've learned with my own stuff. Cause I've had, I've had struggles with depression as well. And I, 
I've learned that you have to realize that your struggles don't go away. The, you know, what I found is I track the times between the breakdown. So, you know, in, in the worst of times for me, it was I, you know, every hour or two, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm depressed. And now, you know, you don't notice it for a few days or a week or a month, whatever. And you get to the point where that's where the progress comes in. But I yeah. like what you talk about where you say you're now using that to help other people because you're actually using it instead of just hiding it or tucking it away and saying, well, I'm doing great, even though I have this, you're leading with that. Yeah. I want people to know. I mean, it's like one of those things. And it's one of the things I, I kind of learned too from doing the, the BSNAP podcast where you look at somebody and you see what they want you to see. You know, mm-hmm. I'd go to interview an athlete and talk to them. And I was, you know, and we do a lot of that world interview, you know, athletes and race directors and stuff like that. And I'd interview an athlete that I'm looking at. And I'm like, this person's amazing. Look at everything they, they can do, blah, blah, blah. I wish I was born with their abilities. And then you talk to them right. and you're like, wait a minute, you used to drink, you used to smoke, you were 300 and something pounds. What? Mm -hmm. And you don't realize that other people have gone through things similar as you, not the exact same. My, my experiences and your experience are always going to be different, but we've gone through trials. We've gone through obstacles and all of us have done different ones. And it's just a matter of understanding that not everybody, what they show you is what, what you see. It's like, I get people all the time that say, look at what I've done. Cause I mean, for those that don't know, I've lost 98 pounds. I'm almost to that hundred pound mark. <laughs> almost there. Um, since February 23rd of last year. So wow. I'm almost to the one year mark. Um, and that's a lot of weight to lose mm-hmm. in a short amount of time. Um, and everyone's like, I wish I had your motivation. I wish I could do what you do. And I post all the time, how fast, you know, how fast I've gotten and all that, you know, just recently I did 20, what, a 5k in 27 minutes and six seconds. Wow. Which I mean, a year ago, I would have been happy to finish one in under 45 minutes, mm-hmm. you know, and everyone keeps looking there. Like, I wish I could be as motivated as you. It's like, you see what I want to see. I, I want you to see, you see, I post on Facebook, all my achievements. And part of that isn't just a brag. Part of that is so that in a year when my memories pop up, I can say, look, look how proud I was that I did this. Look where I was a year ago. Look where I am now. And it's either going to be motivation to continue going or motivation to restart. Right. Yeah. It's a lot of people when they post on social media, we, it's, we see other people's posts and it's hard to not see it as bragging sometimes, yeah. but a, a lot of us do that for our own accountability or for our own motivation in the future. And that's the thing to, to remember and, and to know that underneath those layers, there is all the mud and the muck and the bad days and the, the hard times where you don't even want to get out of bed, but those aren't always seen. No. And I mean, that's one thing. It's like a lot of people don't see like yesterday, you know, I posted when I posted the 27 mile, you know, or 27 minute, you know, 5k. And I'm mm-hmm. like, look, I mean, and most people don't see that the hour before I did that, I was literally laying in bed, not wanting to get out of bed, eating mm-hmm. like Oreos, like <laughs> I don't want to freaking do this. I don't want to get out of bed. I just want to lay here and just not do anything. But then, you know, something in my brain was like, oh, no, you need to get up. You need to do, you know, you need to move. And mm-hmm. People don't see that I, you know, they, everyone thinks I just hop out of bed and birds are singing and I'm like, woohoo, I'm going to go run. No, it's it, most days it's a fight. I have to tell myself, I set goals for myself and I have to look at those goals. And like, if I don't get up and do this this morning, that means I got to do more tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So I better go out and, you know, do this, you know, cause I, I do my goal is a hundred miles, hundred purposeful running miles every month. Wow. And That's what cool. I mean by purposeful, everyone's like, always ask, what does that mean? I'm like, I wear a Fitbit. My Fitbit is my watch. It's on me all day long. If I go by what the Fitbit says, I pace when I talk, when, you know, I mean, oh, anybody, right. you can see the video, my hands are moving constantly. I talk, I, I pace, you know, when I do comedy, I pace when I teaching, you know, classes, I pace. So I don't count those miles. Oh, great. I that only gotcha. count purposeful is I'm going for a run. I put on my running shoes, you know, and mm-hmm. run out the door and either jump on the treadmill or go run out down the street and run. That's the only miles I count. So, yeah. so by the end of the month, you're recording well over a hundred miles because of yeah. all the extra activity. That makes and sense. that was like last year when I finished the year, according to like Strava and all those, I'd done over a thousand miles. Wow. But if you went according to my Fitbit, I'd done over 2,100. Mm. Oh my because gosh. Because that's how much extra I do 
you know, just pacing and all that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I do a lot just walking around. So, yeah, because even just walking, doing chores, running errands, yeah. going to the store, that's going to log a lot of miles too. Yep. But I, I think from an accountability standpoint, that adds an extra element of not fooling yourself into thinking, well, I walked five miles today. And yes, you did walk five, but were they really purposeful five yeah. miles? And that's me. That's why I use all the purposeful. That's my purposeful. I, I got to do at least a hundred purposeful miles every month. And since May of last year, I've done it. So over nine months, I've done a hundred miles every month. Cause I definitely admit when I am tracking my, my miles and stuff, I definitely cheat. And I'm just like, well, it says I went an extra, you know, mile today because of walking back and forth in the store or whatever. So I, I like that. I need, I'm going to have to apply that to myself for my own discipline. And that was me. It's once I started putting goals out like that, like a hundred miles and I have a spreadsheet. I mean, cause I'm a, mm -hmm. I'm a nerd like that. And I keep a spreadsheet that keeps track. So I know how many miles I've done and where I'm at, you know, how close I am to the hundred. Um, mm -hmm. some month, I, some months I go way over. Um, my, my best month I think is 177 miles in a month. Um, but my, you know, and then other months like January, I hit a hundred point three. <laughs> Oh, the wow. last day of the month, I'm like, okay, I need 10 miles <laughs> to finish this. Right. And I did 10.3 miles just to get a little. Right? Yeah. Nice. You know, so it's like, you know, and that's what a lot of people are like, oh, I wish I, it's like some months it's, it's literally like I'm at the end of the month. Like Ugh. there was one month I had to run, what was it? It was like 43 miles in four days mm. to hit the hundred because wow. I just had it. to make up for it. Right. So I had to make up for it. So yeah. I also do, uh, we have a, I think you met Ashley Gudemuth, mm -hmm. who's just moved to the East Coast, I think. Um, she got me going on what they call the run streaks. When it's not the fun run streak, I'm not running naked. Nobody wants to see that. <laughs> but um, where you run at least a mile every day mm -hmm. and go for, you know, keep going as long as you can and running at least a mile. And I'm at just over 200. Days. Wow. That's so awesome. Running at least a mile every day. So in some days it is. It's literally, I, I you know. I go out and if you look at my spreadsheet, you'll see days where it's one mile, one mile, one mile. So I'll walk yeah. out, jump on the treadmill, well, run a mile and just count that. Yeah. And it's important to have those days because of the wear and tear on your body, but also because of just needing a break or sometimes you don't have the time for the long run, but you still want to, you still yeah. need to log that time and that credit. And that is, is that a lot of it's time. I mean, I, I'm one of those people I, I have figured out with myself. If you, if I give myself downtime, bad things happen <laughs> I <laughs> yeah I, decisions. yeah me too i just kind of waste it so i i have to keep myself busy so mm -hmm. and that's one of the that is one of the issues that i have though sometimes is because i have you know what between brandon and mike there's four shows that i do mm -hmm. so because i've got beastnet re nerdish love and hate radio and then down the rabbit hole yeah and then i'm a full-time job safety professional going out and teaching classes stuff like that and then I'm also in school. I'm trying to finish my bachelor's yeah. degree. So and, and I, family, like <laughs> yeah, and family. So yeah. and you know, and, and I try and keep keep myself busy a lot. I, I'm not a sleeper. I only sleep about five to six hours a night. Anything you know, and I usually don't do much more than that. Wow. If I try and do more than that, I'll wake up. So I wake up after about five or six hours. So I'm I'm not a sleeper. So I'm ready to go then. Yeah. So so Mike, what is the um? What was there a point when you noticed you could take? your, your experience with depression and start to help other people. Was there an event or an aha moment or something that happened where you realized that was the purpose for it? I don't know if there was an actual moment. I think part of it was being in the hospital, but that was kind of when I started to see it. Mm -hmm. I, I think it was just kind of, it, it progressed over time and I just kept seeing it more and more. And I kept having these opportunities thrown in front of me. Um, when I, I stepped out of because one of the things when I became a, I've only been a safety professional in actual profession for about three years, mm. a little over three years. Before that, I was actually the operations manager for a demolition company. I ran it. Okay. Um, and I just, my stress level was too high. I stepped away. I started doing, you know, safety. And then I kept having these things thrown in front of me of mental health. And it just seemed like it was like the universe was telling me, this is something you need you can't to get away from it. Right. You know, and I just couldn't get away from it where I was like, you know, this is something that you should teach on mental health. This is something you should do. And it just kept stepping in front of me. And finally, I'm like, maybe this is what I need to look more into. And mm -hmm. I started looking more into it. And I'm like, you know, I can use my experiences when I'm talking to people. Cause that's one thing I found too, is when I'm teaching or someone, I'm taking a class when I have a teacher, that's obvious they've been through it and they're not just reading off a book like, Oh, oh right. yeah, this book says, 
you know, but it's someone that's been through and has those life experiences. I seem to listen a lot more. Mm -hmm. And I found that with me when I can show life experiences of, you know, I have literally been there and literally, you know, basically made an attempt at my life Mm -hmm. where other people who are just talking about it, I've been there. Um, I've had, you know, friends, I've had family Um, in the comedy world. I've known what five now comedians Mm -hmm. since I started doing comedy nine years ago that have taken their own life. Um, You know, my, my daughter's brother, brother, which it's a long story to explain how my daughter has a brother. That's not my kid, but whatever. But (laughs) um, her brother, uh, you know, died from suicide. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's something that's been part of my life and I've seen my family, it runs in my family, manic depression and bipolar and all that. So it's something I see a lot of. So it just became something that where I could use my experiences to talk to people and be like, Hey, I can help others not go down that road. Yeah. You know? Do and, you remember how you felt the first time you opened up about it? Scared. I'm yeah. um, scared because I didn't want people. I mean, cause we all grew. I mean, I'm in my forties and our generation, that was not something we talked about. You did not talk about feelings as a guy. You did not have feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, you did not talk about them. It was just something you didn't do. So it was really tough for me to finally start talking about my feelings of this is, you know, this is how I feel. You know, I feel this way. I feel, you know, uh, like I don't belong in a lot of places. And that was one of the biggest ones. It's really hard for me. And I still have that problem. And I don't know why. I don't know if it's because, you know, I've had doctors tell me that they think part of it's the way I grew up, um, stuff like that. I've never felt like I belong in groups. I always feel like I'm an outsider just on the edge, just on the fringe of the group. Um, And that's tough for me. And that's one of the things I have to deal with. And one of the things I still deal with um, daily is, you know, being that feeling I'm on the fringe, feeling like I'm, I'm an imposter. That's Mm -hmm. one of the reasons I wanted to get my degree. I backdoored my way into safety and got in through injuries and everything like that. And just getting certifications without actually going to school and getting a degree where I'm surrounded by all these people that have degrees and I'm right there in their group. And I felt like an imposter and I felt like I didn't really fit. And that was kind of hoping that, you know, when I get the degree, it'll help me fit. But still, I never, I'm always that way. I always feel like I'm on the fringe of a group, even in my own family. I feel like I'm on that fringe. Like I'm not really a part of it. I'm just kind of, I'm a non-player character. I'm an NPC <laughs> in my own life. Well, and I think that's important to, to call out because when, you know, the more we talk about mental health, I think one thing that people aren't aware of is how much so many of us feel like we're on the fringe. Like we could be in the center of the conversation, but still feel like we're not, you know, necessarily needed in that. Or will I really be missed if I'm not there? Um, I, when I was, you know, in, in darker places, I would sometimes step out of things and just wait to see how long it would take for people to notice that I wasn't there. Yep. And I, I remember doing that and just, and then sitting in my own resentment and, and shame and being upset and be like, yeah, are they even going to notice? Look, it's been two hours. It's been a day or it's been a week. Has no one's even called. And, and I was caught up in my own space too much to even real, to even think about the fact that they're, they could be sitting in a corner somewhere else wondering why I'm not calling them. Yeah. You know, and that is something to think about because I've done that too, where it's just like, you know, you know, why haven't they called me? It's been a month, you know, mm-hmm. they don't care. And then you're like, oh, well, I could have called them too. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. Maybe, you know, like I said, maybe you said maybe they're doing the same thing. So mm-hmm. it, it's one of those weird things that, you know, you, you never know uh, yeah. you know, how, how things are going. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Now, now you said you, you said scared and, and you talked about imposter syndrome when you actually did open up and share do you remember like after you did it how did you feel like was there an immediate relief or was it hesitation or it was a little of both i mean it was kind of immediate relief that i finally said it because it was kind of like in the setting where I, where i said it um it was in a in, in a group thing while i was you know in the hospital um mm-hmm. and other people were agreeing and i'm like oh maybe i'm not alone in this but at the same time i was you know and it sounds horrible to say this. I'm thinking, well, they're in the, we're this, this hospital with me. So obviously they got issues too, but, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, and it was, it was a horrible thing to say, but I mean, in that same time, it kind of, you know, we all know that where we get something where we're like, Oh, this is, this is okay. But then we find ways to back out of it and say, yeah, but right. You know, and that was my biggest problem is it, it still took a while before I really started admitting that it's okay. 
to talk about these things. You know, it's okay to talk about, you know, my issues. It's okay to talk about what, you know, stuff that's getting to me. And I still fight with it. Um, I still fight with it quite a bit that, you know, um, where you do that, you know, passive aggressive where, you know, why, why aren't they noticing that this is a problem? Well, because you haven't told them. Yeah. And that's one thing I think all too often we forget that other people don't know our needs until we let them know. And mm -hmm. even when we do let them know, sometimes it takes a reminder or kind of a firm conversation to let them know, Hey, I mentioned this, but this is a serious need. This isn't yeah. just in passing. And, that, and that's kind of one of those things that I found too, is it's one of those things that sometimes, especially when you have that whole imposter syndrome and everything else, when you portray your needs, you portray them in a way that's kind of like, well, if you want, this is something mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind doing. Yeah. But in all reality, it's like, no, that's not how you should present it. It's like, no, this is an actual need that I have. Yeah. It's not something that I would like. It's not a, it's not a nice to have desire kind of thing. Yeah. It's the, the way my men, mental brain, the way everything works in my brain, this is something I actually need, mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes I don't think they get that where it's more of a, they think that, oh, this is something I would like, but no, it's right. like, you know, and I think that's part of, you know, with you have that imposter syndrome and everything else, you don't want to be the demanding one because mm -hmm. you feel like that if you start demanding, people are going to look close and be like, well, you don't even belong here. Yeah. You know, uh, a friend of mine, Melissa Hughes, uh, she's a neuroscientist, a doctor of neuroscience, and she um, has been on the show and she talked about imposter syndrome. And and for me, that was was eye opening at the time, because here's someone who I really looked up to, who I see as someone who's who's made it and doing all the things I want to do and speaking yep. and running a business and writing books and talking about feeling like an imposter. And I was like, wait a second, why would you feel that way? But one of the facts that she shared is that the more you the more success you have, the more, more successful people actually experience it more often. Yeah. And the way I mess with my brain is, so now whenever I start to feel imposter syndrome, I'm like, yes, I'm making it. There's imposter syndrome again. And it kind of helps me get through that moment. I mean, it doesn't always, you know, just immediately make it go away, but it does kind of help me have that conversation in my head of this is normal. This means things are actually going well, yeah. uh, because I, because we know ourselves better than anybody and we immediately start discrediting all the reasons why people should listen to us or why we should be um, of any esteem in any realm. So, yeah, no. And I, and that's so true. And that's one of the things that for me, it's been just trying to, you know, and I, and I think we've talked, we've talked about this before when you've been on my shows, mm -hmm. you know, the imposter syndrome. And yeah, it's, I always love your idea of, you know, there it is again, that means I'm doing something right. You know? And it's one of those things like my wife could mad at me all the time because it's like with school I will sit there and write a paper and I'm like that is the biggest hunk of crap I've ever written in my life <laughs> mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden I get it graded and it's like a B or an A and she's like really you know or I'll bitch about right. how bad my grades are I'll post all the time you know these get degrees and stuff like that like I'm doing <laughs> and it's like you have a 3.6 GPA you right know? <laughs> that's yeah that's nothing to be ashamed of you're, you're not you know you're you're in the honor you know you're in the mm -hmm. you know honor basically whatever on a roll, what do you were? I'm like, yeah, but it's not a 4.0. And, and I feel like for me is a, along with the imposter syndrome, I put unrealistic goals on myself. Yeah. You know, I, I can relate to that. Point. When I run a lot, I'll put unrealistic goals. Like I want to, you know, I was doing the other day where I was mad at myself because I wanted less than 10 minute miles for a full half marathon and I'm okay. running and I'm like, I'm going to do this. Wow. And I didn't, I didn't make it. Mm -hmm. And I was pissed at myself. And then I'm looking at the time and I'm like, I finished with the best half marathon time I've ever had. So I had a goal to do something I've never been able to do. And I'm mad at myself because I didn't do it, mm -hmm. but I did better than I ever had. So it's kind of like, you know, I think that's where a lot of us do is we set unrealistic goals that it's like, we're never going to make it. So we give ourselves goals that we can't, we know we can't do. Yeah. And there's be mad at ourselves for not doing it. And there's some trick to finding the balance between setting a goal that's right, but not feeling like if I don't get to that unrealistic goal, that it's necessarily failure. Yeah. You know, you can have a really good accomplishment and maybe you wanted to do better, but not having our mind go from it's all or nothing to just, I failed because I've done that with things where I'm putting on an event and I have this lofty goal to have a thousand people show up or buy tickets or watch online and I've never had a thousand people do that. So I don't know why I thought I would have a thousand people, but I still may have had more people than ever show up, or I may have had more interaction or some other goal might've, what might've gotten achieved yet. 
you get fixated on that one thing and it, it kind of blinds you to how good you're really doing. Yeah. And that is so true. And that's kind of one of the things that I've been really trying to do. I, I, one of my friends gave me a, a great thing when I, about running. He's like, you run for distance or you run for time, mm. but never both. Mm. So you focus on your distance and the time will come. You focus on the time and the distance will come. So focus on one, not the other. And that's, I've been really focusing on just distance. You know, I know how far I can run and just do it. And that was like when I hit the 27 minute, you know, 5k, I never looked at my watch. I never looked at my, my phone to see what my pace was, anything, which normally I would, I'm checking constantly. What's my pace. Am I, am I staying where I should be? Am I doing what I should be? I'm just like, Nope, I know where I need to go. And I know where I need to, you know, and to turn around and come back to the house. And right. I took off and I ran and I came back and I finished and I'm like, Ooh, I feel good. Looked at the time. And I'm like, that's a minute faster than I've ever done. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. You know? And it's just, I think you run into that thing where you get so focused on what your goal is because you give yourself multiple, you know, measurements that you focus on so many different measurements that you miss all of them mm -hmm. to where yeah. if you focus on one that most of the time you hit all four because you're so you're actually actively working hard for that one goal that actually completes the rest of them and brings them all in. And yeah. you know, I, I see that with running quite a bit where it's like, I just focus on my distance. I know how far I need to go. And then all of a sudden the time just comes with it. You know, I, I love that idea of taking all these goals and kind of picking one to focus on and let the others fall in line. Cause I'm, as you were saying that I started thinking about different areas in my life where I have done that exact same thing. It's like, well, I'm going to have this many listeners. I'm going to have this many, you know, uh, views. I'm going to all, all these things. Yeah. Whereas if I just focus on, you know, for making a good show or whatever, you know, writing a good blog, whatever it is I'm going to focus on, the rest will come in line. And I, I need, I need to do that with a lot of my life. I can picture that. <laughs> and I do too. To heart. I do too. I mean, it's one of those things that I say that, but I know there's a lot of places I don't do it. It comes out of that old saying, you know, Jack of all trades, master of none. Mm -hmm. So if you focus on too many goals, you can't focus on one enough. So, but right. if you focus on that one goal and focus hard on that one, all the rest of them kind of fall into place. So it's kind of like, you know, if I keep focusing on all of them, I'm looking at all these different measurements and I'm spending so much time looking at the measurements and everything else. I'm not looking at the actual, what I'm doing. So right. you kind of lose focus. So if you focus on one, it kind of gives you that tunnel vision, but that tunnel vision, once you come out of it at the end, you're like, oh, well, shoot, because I made this one goal, all these other ones that were kind of, you know, sub goals, like the, you know, the, the, the side missions kind of, you know, popped up and I, I actually finished them at the same time. So, right. You don't, you don't want to end up being a Jack of all races, winner of none. Yeah. 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 Pretty much. So, so uh, I got one last question for you, and that is what advice would you give our listeners and viewers to own their awkward? Don't focus on what other people are doing. Hmm. Look at yourself. Um, and that's one of the biggest things for me was, you know, like I said, I've lost almost 100 pounds. Um, I've gone from running, you know, a 5K, hoping I can do less than 45 minutes to doing less than 20, you know, doing just over 27 minutes. Um, and part of that was I stopped trying to be somebody else. I mm. stopped looking at someone going, I wish I could be like them. And just started thinking, I wish I could be better than I was yesterday. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. I started focusing on looking at me and saying, this is where I am now. And just kept doing measurements of where I am tomorrow. Where was I yesterday? Okay, I was here yesterday. Now I'm here today. You know, And I'm better than I was yesterday. So I'm winning. Mm -hmm. And that was it. It was small wins. And then also at the same time, looking at the big picture where all of a sudden, you know, I'll look at something and be like, dang it, I gained a pound since last week, but I've lost 98 since February. So yes, I did have a bad week, but mm -hmm. that bad week doesn't change the fact that I've had a good year. Right. You know, and that's where I think a lot of people make mistakes when they go on diets, when they go on exercise, stuff like that, they have a bad week and they give up because, oh, well, I gained two pounds, but you've lost 30. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. look at the whole picture, you know, don't let a small obstacle, you know, change the fact that you overcome a huge one, you know? Yeah. No, I think that's, I think that's really good. And I think the, uh, the not looking at everybody else is, is critical because that's, that's just the world right now is we're, yep. we're in front of people and people are in front of us all day long, whether you like it or not, you open up your phone and you're seeing what's going on. 
and whether you asked for it or not. And so learning yeah. to not compare is, is will give and you that's a lot the thing. of peace. With Facebook, you have to remember what everyone's showing you, they're showing you their best selves. Mm -hmm. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, they're showing you your best, their best selves. They're not taking the picture when they first get out of bed before they put their makeup on. Right. They're not, you know, taking the pictures of, you know, when they've tried doing the exercises and they failed 15 times in a row, they're just showing you the one win, yeah. you know, and that's what you have to think about. You know, it's one of those things, like I said, I post pictures, you know, and stuff of what I've done, but now February 23rd is when I started everything. So I'm sure all of a sudden it's going to start rolling around where I was a year ago. And I can look at that now and say, look, a year ago, I was 282 pounds. Right. Yeah. And that's amazing. now I'm 185. You know, and it's kind of like you're looking at those going, yes, that was a horrible picture. And yes, you're looking at me now at 185, but I was 282, mm -hmm. you know, and I let myself get that way, you know, and I made mistakes to get myself there that way. And I kept looking at everyone else going, why can't I be them? Because I'm not them. Mm -hmm. I have different body makeup. I, you know, I have different, you know, genetics. I have different everything else. So I have to look at myself and figure out how I can make me better. You know, if you make yourself a better person, now all of a sudden I have people telling me all the time how I'm an inspiration to them. They want to be like me. And I'm like, don't be like me. Be a better version of you. No, I like that. And you are an inspiration, but I won't try to be you. So all right, that's good. <laughs> awesome. Well, Mike, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you on. I, I always love our conversations. We could, as you know, we could go on for hours. You're good. Uh, we just, we go down the rabbit holes, even though that's not the show. That's Mike's other show. Check yes. that out. Um, it's, it's a fun one. Like I said, we're conspiracy realists. We go down and find the facts mm -hmm. and then tell you where we jump, where people jump the shark. So yeah. most of it, a lot of the other theories, people are like, Oh, you believe that? No. If you actually listen to the episode, most of them were like, yeah, this is stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and each, each show is a different rabbit hole they're going down. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty yeah. fun. It's fun. Uh, so go down the rabbit hole with them and we'll, all those links are in the description. So check out all of Mike's shows and don't get confused if some say Brandon, cause uh, we covered that earlier. Yep. So uh, thank you so much, Mike. Always a pleasure. Always and pleasure. Uh, everyone, uh, definitely enjoy your week. And as always, own your awkward. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening in for today's show. Be sure to visit awkwardcareer.com to continue your journey. And of course, please like, subscribe, and share with your friends so they can find their awkward side and learn how to own it. <laughs>